I have to admit, I didn't expect this turn of events. My car wasn't running well. It needed to be serviced, and I didn't have the money to do it. Maybe I shouldn't be driving it, but I had no choice. I closed the door and saw the looks of the people around me as I got out of the car. My BMW didn't belong in this neighborhood. I headed for the Secretary of State's office as I entered the office, probably oriented by the way I was dressed. The security guard pointed me to the license renewal lane. I shook my head, and he looked at me with a puzzled look. Do you need another picture? he asked. I shook my head negatively. What are you here for? he asked. Almost every head in the crowded office turned to listen. Most of them didn't even have the decency to pretend they weren't interested. I'm here to register for public assistance, I said quietly. Well, you know, welfare. So I have no income or money, and I'm going to starve to death. Welfare? Or did they just come and throw me and all my stuff out of the city apartment I moved into after being evicted from the house I thought I was going to live in for the rest of my life? Is that welfare? Or maybe it's me not being able to get a goddamn job to save my butt because no one's hiring me. That's welfare. Calm down, lady, he said in a nervous voice. Half the people in this office are registering or dealing with Social Security. I know what you need. Go in there and get one of those forms. Fill it out completely and drop it in the drawer by the counter. Then sit down and you will get a call. How long will it take them to call me? I asked. Not very long, he said. It shouldn't be longer than two or three hours. He wasn't kidding. People were asleep waiting to be called. There was a magazine rack in the corner, but it was empty. I got the impression that most of the magazines were not returned when those who read them were done with them. Everyone in the place kept looking at me. I knew they were wondering why the heck a man dressed like me was here. It's a long and rather funny story. It all started exactly two years after next Tuesday. My name is Melinda Conrad. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking my name sounds an awful lot like Mel Conrad. That guy who got rich last year and gives all his money away to charities and stuff. Well, you're right. He is my husband. Okay. Technically, he's my ex-husband. And you know what else? I got a bad deal. I'm directly responsible for making this man a goddamn gazillionaire, and I have nothing to show for it. Okay. Maybe I'm not directly responsible. But if I hadn't forced him to divorce me, he wouldn't be rich. So, I deserve some credit, do not I? Two years ago, we were happy as heck. We weren't rich. We were a typical, ordinary, everyday, middle-class family. My husband, Melvin Conrad, my daughter Melissa Conrad and I were like three peas in a pod. We were a very close-knit family. We had a great house. That's what I got pushed out of. Then I had to move into that crappy apartment I just got evicted from. But anyway, let's get on with the story. All three of us loved each other like there was no tomorrow. My husband wasn't very interesting, but he was nice enough and loved me. He worked very hard to provide for our family, and as I said, we were comfortable. Our daughter had just finished her freshman year at a state university when it hit me. There are so many names for the same thing these days. But you know, the one I had. Some call it a midlife crisis. Others call it a hormonal imbalance. Others call it empty nest syndrome. These are all great names for spoiled woman who is bored, does stupid things, and usually regrets it. Sometimes it affects men, too. So you guys shouldn't feel superior or immune to it when you see a balding 40-year-old man driving a darn sports car with a 20-year-old blonde next to him. He's probably got the disease. Anyway, I invited my husband over for dinner because I had something I needed to tell him, something terrible I'd done, and I needed to lighten the mood. I am, to say the least, decent-looking at 40, I was still capable of wrinkling my nose on a good day. I'm a little heavier than I was when we first met, but that's okay. Mel loved me so much and I was such a fool. He showed up a little late, no more than five minutes late, and I didn't beat him up for it. He smiled at me. His face still lit up like a Christmas tree every time he saw me. You'd think we hadn't seen each other for weeks. But it was really just that morning. I was very nervous when he wrapped his arms around me and hugged me. Butterflies fluttered in my stomach. Something told me I was doing a BFM. He sat down across from me. The look on his face expressed absolute joy. I was sure he thought it was a good sign. I hated to part with the man I had lived with, loved and raised my daughter with for over twenty years. But there was no choice. It was either him or my happiness. How was your day, dear? he asked. Darn him. After all, 
He was the one who'd gone and worked all day. What did he think I'd been doing all day? Did he really think I was working on a cure for cancer or trying to solve the Middle East crisis? I woke up at nine and loaded the dishwasher through the laundry in the washer, and my day was half over. Mel, I want a divorce, I told him. He spit out the glob of water. He just drank right in my face. I'm sure it was an accident, but it ruined my makeup and hair. I sat like that with water and saliva running down my face while he tried to catch his breath. Are you serious? he asked quietly. Very. I replied with as much dignity as I was capable of considering. I looked like a raccoon, and my waterproof mascara had proven once and for all that it wasn't waterproof. He stood up, wiped his mouth, and said, My lawyer will contact you. The pain and heartache on his face just hurt me. I felt like the lowest scumbag on earth. Everything inside me, every fiber of my being, was telling me to get on my knees and tell him it was just a joke. But I didn't move. He turned to leave, dropping a few bills on the table. Wait, Mel, I said. This isn't what was supposed to happen. Do not you want to talk about it and ask me some questions? Do not we need to discuss how the divorce is going to go? He turned to me, looked at me curiously, and asked why. I was shocked. I replayed the whole thing in my head over a hundred times, and not one of them had this reaction. He didn't get angry or cry. He didn't demand an explanation or threaten me. He just accepted my words and moved on. What will it do? Will it make me feel better? Will it make you feel different? I doubt all of this. I'm pretty sure that if you're doing this, it means you found someone else and you want to be with him. What I felt for you obviously wasn't enough to change your mind, even though it wouldn't have mattered. If you're acting like this, it means you've already slept with him, right? I nodded my head and said, but he interrupted me. Which means you are no longer of interest to me, he said coldly. Okay, do you want questions? Do I need to take a DNA test or is Melissa mine? God, Mel, I said. For heaven's sake, of course she's yours. What do you take me for? You're not likely to like the answer to that question, he said. Goodbye, Melinda. Then he turned and walked away. He didn't seem to be as angry or upset as I thought he would be. Damn it, Mel, I shouted after him. Why do not you even try to fight for me? My voice echoed throughout the restaurant. He turned again, and from three tables away, he relayed his answer. Why, Melinda? He asked. I can't change how you feel. Who am I to try to tell you that your feelings are wrong? Obviously, you do not love me the way I love you. If I did, it wouldn't have worked out. Since you do not love me anymore, I have to forget you and move on. Besides, I only fight for what I want. And after what you said tonight, it's not about you anymore. Have a nice life. I have no intention of standing in your way. Everyone in the restaurant stared at me as Mel headed for the door. I felt a shiver run down my spine. I'd read about a similar sensation. They say it occurs when someone walks over the ground you'll be buried under. I guess what it really means is that, as I said, I did it from both my heart and my head were screaming at me about it, but I couldn't listen to them. I called the waiter and asked him where the ladies' room was. When I got home that night, I realized by the empty drawers and closet that my husband was gone. All chances of undoing it were over. I had the worst headache imaginable. I picked up my cell phone and called Greg. He would make me feel better. Yes, he replied. It's me, I said. I told him. Cool, he said. How did he take it? Did he yell and try to beg you to stay with him? Did he beat you on your hands and feet? No, I said. He just stood up and walked away from me. He was very calm under the circumstances. He took it very well. Do you want me to come and shake the brains out of you? He asked. No, I said. I just ended a 20-year relationship with a man who worshipped the ground I walked on. I think I need to be alone. Okay, see you later, he said, and hung up. I think it was at that moment that I realized I had underestimated my friend. I knew all the reasons I wanted a divorce. Greg was younger, much younger, and he made me feel alive. Greg, at 29, was 11 years younger than me and 9 years older than my daughter. He was wild and uninhibited. He was everything. Mel wasn't. I crouched on the edge of our huge double bed. When I looked at the bed, it had never seemed so big and so empty. 
I poured myself a glass of wine and wondered what new direction my life would take from now on. Sometime around midnight, after tossing and turning and unable to sleep, I pulled out one of our old photo albums and looked through some of Melanie's memories from 22 years. The next morning was even worse. I woke up and wondered why it was bothering me. I sat at my desk and just watched a cup of my favorite coffee turn to room temperature sludge. I do not know why I didn't move, but I had no reason to do anything about it. I mentally replayed the conversation I'd had with Mel the night before and the conversation I'd had with Greg at the beginning of the evening. Mel was looking at me like the sun was shining out of my butt by the end of the evening. He was looking at me in a completely different way. He looked at me the way one looks at a problem or project at work, like I was just another problem that needed to be solved to end the day. And Greg ruined it. He should have offered to just come over and give me a hug or be with me when someone is going through a severe emotional loss. They need to know that someone cares about them. I knew Greg was young, so I gave him a break. Preparing him to be the person I thought he could be was a big part of the excitement. I knew I had hurt Mel badly. That's what made me feel so bad. But I was sure he'd be okay in the end. Who was I kidding? I knew he'd be miserable without me. But at that moment, I was only thinking about my feelings. My tenure was coming to an end. Heck, I'd given this man the best years of my darn life. We'd done our part in the breeding of the species. We raised a child. Our duty to society was over. It was time to have some fun. I wanted to be happy, but I didn't want to wait until the golden years. Why not be happy while I was still young enough to know what happiness was? The morning after her story, I woke up in my hotel room. At first, I didn't realize where I was. The room was dark and the sheets smelled different. They smelled like antiseptic, like medicine. So I guess they were clean enough. They didn't have that odor. That comes after weeks of washing with the soaps that were on the market, or traces of body fluids, farts, tears, and spilled food that someone had tried to wash out of them. In other words, they didn't smell like love. I sat up on the bed and remembered where I was, and why I was here before I messed up and reached for her. My mind remembered that she wouldn't be here, but my body and heart still, Mr. Egba. I said to myself, and prepared myself for what I had to do. I had a lot of things to do before I could allow myself to sink into the depression I knew was just around the corner. I thought about calling it a day and just staying here to be miserable, but eventually I would have to go outside. And today was as good a day as any. Before I turned on the light and shattered the blanket of darkness, I'd pulled over me so I couldn't see the tears. I made a list of things I needed to do today. I needed to call my lawyer. The guy I usually dealt with didn't do divorce or family law. Perhaps he could recommend someone. I needed to find a more permanent place to live. I was probably leaning toward either giving Melinda the house or selling it. Whatever was best for me, I didn't see the need to make any decisions based on Melinda's needs or comfort. I needed to call my daughter to make sure she could always reach me. I wasn't going to make her choose between me and a cheater but I also wanted her to know that I still wanted to be as big a part of her life as she would allow me to be. I needed to separate Melinda from myself financially. Let the judge and lawyers work things out, but I wouldn't give her a penny more than I owed her. At the same time, I needed to make sure my assets stayed mine. We also had a few social obligations that I needed to tactfully inquire about. I wasn't going to become a hermit, but I didn't want to date anyone. Nor did I want to try to become a parody of myself by pretending everything was fine while the shreds of my broken heart were telling me it wasn't, with these thoughts in mind. I called my father-in-law to talk about the barbecue we were supposed to go to on their anniversary weekend. Hey, Bob, I said when he picked up the phone. Mel, how's it going? he asked. You're still bringing dos equis, aren't you? Bob, that's exactly what I wanted to talk to you about, I said. I'd really like to congratulate you and Jean on your anniversary. Your marriage is something I'd like to have when I'm your age, but I can't make it on Saturday, so I was hoping you'd let me take you two out to dinner Friday night. Stuck at work, he said. I remember those days. Do not let yourself get upset, Mel. So we're going on a double date. I haven't been on one in a while. That sounds like fun. Maybe you'll let me do a couple dances with your wife. I've always liked younger women. 
Bob, it'll just be me and you two here. I'm not seeing anyone right now. But if you feel uncomfortable, just tell me and I'll send you a present or something, I said. Mel, what the heck is going on? He asked. Your voice hasn't sounded right since you started that darn call. Bob, your daughter took me out to dinner last night, I said. While we were there, she told me she wants a divorce. She's found someone else and wants to be with him. What? He shouted. What did she do? There must be something else going on. Have you done something to her? Are you cheating on her? No, sir, I said quietly. Mel, I'll call you back. I need to. He began. Please, Bob, I do not want to make a fuss. I'm sure she'll tell you herself in her own time. I said I do not want to cause trouble or detract from the event in any way. We should be celebrating the fact that you've been married for 45 years. We should be honoring those who made it through, not tearing ourselves apart over those who didn't. I'll call you next week, and then we can talk. I just do not want you or Jean to think that I do not realize how special what you two have built is. One minus, one minus, one minus, I thought, dialing my daughter, Melissa's number. Luckily for me, she was away from her cell phone. I suppose I could have dialed her cell number, but I didn't really feel like talking to her. I just left my cell number and let her know that from now on, she could reach me on it or my work number. One more call, and I got a referral to a divorce attorney. The woman seemed angry on the phone, but agreed to meet with me later that morning. I pulled out my laptop and started looking at condos and apartments. Most of them were the same, except for the prices. Somehow, I didn't see the benefit of buying a unit in a building you'll never own. I think I'll eventually want to buy another building, so renting was fine with me. Heck, I might even end up buying Melinda out of our house. I took a quick shower and dressed in my usual business clothes. I didn't really like ties, but the sweater and sport coat looked good on me. I decided to also purchase a gym membership. After all, I might want to get my property in shape if I was going to try to get another woman interested enough to jump at my chance. I stepped outside and smiled for the first time since Melinda had passed me yesterday. There was a woman standing in the hotel parking lot with a little boy. She was struggling to pull him away from my Mustang. There used to be three things that made me smile every time I saw them. The first was my wife, Melinda. The second was my daughter, Melissa. The last was my 09 Mustang GT. Every time I looked at that car, I smiled and shook my head. It takes me back to my childhood, when I used to roll my Hot Wheels cars all over our living room floor. The commute to work was always a pleasure, and today was no different. It was a chance to focus on something other than the fact that I felt like crap for a little while. I walked into my office, and my assistant Joyce pounced on me like a hound on a fox. Melinda has already called you twice this morning, she said. She says she can't get through to your cell phone. Joyce, have a seat, I said, indicating for her to sit in the chair behind my desk. She sat down and smiled broadly. Have you finally realized that I'm the reason for your success and decided to reward me on my own merits? She asked. Joyce was not only my assistant, but a friend. We had been together so long that it was as if we were relatives. Joyce, do you remember the dinner? I had to leave this place in a hurry for last night, I asked. She nodded her head. I bet someone got lucky last night, she said. Well, if anyone did it, it wasn't me, I said. All I got was a kick in the teeth. Melinda told me she wanted a divorce. Joyce looked at me and saw that I couldn't help myself. What a jerk, she said. Guess you didn't expect this turn of events. I shook my head. Joyce stood up and pushed me into a chair. She stroked my shoulders and tried to express sympathy. If you need anything, let me know, she said. For now, I won't ask you to lie. Can't you just tell her the truth? Tell her I'm not taking her calls. I said. Joyce looked at me and nodded. I realized she wanted to ask more. Everyone always wants to know all the details. But she realized I didn't want to talk about it. She was kind enough and smart enough not to push. Just before lunch, I picked up a file folder in which I put copies of all my financial documents. I left the office and went to my appointment with my lawyer. Her office was not at all what I expected. I guess I thought it would be a large office building and that either the whole building or most of it would be owned or leased by a large law firm. I was wrong on both counts. It was a small one-story office that was part of a shopping center next to the office. 
On one side was a small medical clinic. The other side was occupied by a Fredericks of Hollywood franchise. Farther down, the strip was a liquor store. All of the businesses seemed to be thriving. The discrepancy in the types of businesses seemed strange at first, until I thought about it. After thinking about it, I realized that there was actually one business missing here. If you were having marital problems, you could come here and buy your wife some lingerie. You could plan a nice romantic evening and buy something at Frederick's to spice it up. If that doesn't work, you have a convenient divorce lawyer. You find out she cheated on you and head to the clinic for an STD test and then to the liquor store to drown your sorrow. Shopping at the mall was quick, easy, and convenient. The only thing missing was a therapist or marriage counselor, maybe a detective agency, and gun store would be nice too. I opened the door and went inside. A nice elderly woman asked who I was and the purpose of my visit. Melvin Conrad to see and Wilson. I said I have an appointment for noon. She smiled and told me to have a seat and Ms. Wilson would be right over. The woman was at least sixty years old, but she was still stunning. No sooner had I lowered myself into the seat than Ann Wilson opened the door to her office and gestured for me to enter. And Wilson was a large woman with long black hair and piercing blue eyes. She looked at me with the same gaze that all predators use to study possible prey. Tell me a story, she said. This statement surprised me. I looked at her in bewilderment. She only raised one eyebrow and continued to look at me. All right, I said. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. Very funny. She smirked. Tell me about your divorce and the reasons for it. Mr. Conrad, time is money. I do not want to waste yours or mine, but it's very unlikely. I'll take your case. My shoulders slumped, and I began to tell her the protracted story of my marriage to Melinda. When I got to the story of dinner the night before, she hissed and sucked in air. Wait, she said sharply. What has she done? She took us out to dinner at her favorite restaurant and told us she wanted a divorce because she found a new man and she's already had love with him, I said. Miss Wilson stood up. Did you ever cheat on her? She asked, and leaning over, looked at me intently. Never, ma'am, I said. What did you do when she told you that? She asked. Ma'am, there's nothing I can do. I left money on the table for her dinner if she decided to eat. Then I went home. I packed my clothes and checked into a hotel. I said Miss Wilson shook her head. It wasn't the most sensible thing to do. Your leaving will probably give her the opportunity to settle in the house temporarily until we can come to an arrangement. Is the house in your name? Her name? Or both? She asked quickly, jotting things down in her notebook. My name is, I said. Melinda doesn't work outside our house. Then why the heck did you leave? She asked, shaking her head. You're just as bad as the women. Jesus. She tossed the notebook across the room and looked at me for a while. I got the same feeling my third grade teacher had when she was trying to get me to memorize the times table of numbers. That feeling of, darn, how many times do we have to repeat this? It was as if Ms. Wilson expected me to know the ins and outs of divorce laws and procedures. I stood up, and she turned her head on its neck to meet my fierce gaze again. Where are you going? She snarled. Well, I figured you didn't want my case because I was doing it all wrong, I said. In the same instant, her gaze softened and she pressed the button on her desk. She spoke into the intercom and ordered her assistant, who was also her aunt, to bring the cart. A gorgeous older woman entered the office with a cart full of coffee and fresh donuts. Ms. Wilson poured herself a cup and took two donuts. I took a cup of black coffee myself. You didn't do anything wrong, Mr. Conrad, she said. That's why I got so angry. I do not usually represent men in divorce cases because they usually turn out to be wrong. The typical scenario involves a man who has cheated on his wife many times, usually with some trophy woman. When his wife has had enough, he tries to assault her in the divorce and leave her penniless and homeless. I have developed a reputation for getting my clients the best deal in a divorce, and now many men are trying to use me to get better terms, even though I do not think they deserve it. Why the heck should they have their cake and eat it too? If they cheat and destroy a marriage, they should pay for it. You've worked your whole life supporting this woman. You've provided her with a good life and home. Judging from your address 
and the fact that your daughter is in college from examining your financial records, I can see that you have been a good provider. And finally, you're not a very good actor, Mr. Conrad. You try to act like this is all well and fine, but I can see that it has devastated you, and you are just trying to move on. Heck, you're too shaken up to be angry yet, and the pain isn't even gone yet. What scares me the most is that you do not even try to fight what she wants. She says she wants a divorce. You didn't even force her to file for divorce. You did it because she asked for it. She's the one cheating. And you go home and move out of the house you worked on instead of telling her to leave. She should have moved in with her lover or her parents if they are still living. Mr. Conrad, I will definitely take your case. Someone has to protect you, if only to keep you from giving her everything you have. We spent the rest of the day going over my financial documents and the value of our assets to determine how best to proceed. Several times, Ms. Wilson looked at me like I was stupid and asked questions like, So you want to just give her the house for free and you'll pay the mortgage yourself? In other words, you want to pay for her to live there with the guy she's having fun with? Well, probably not, I said. But inside me, the effect of her words was already starting to take effect. Why are you giving her almost all of your savings? She asked. Well, she needs money to live. I said she doesn't have a job. It's just money. I can always make more. I felt like Ms. Wilson was about to slap me. She doesn't have a job because she sat on her butt. Most of her life while you supported her. She has a college degree so she can get a job. She's the one who wanted a change in her life. Let's give her that opportunity. I think we should split 60-40 in your favor. We will pay her alimony for six months and no more. All other assets should be split 50-50, including the house. And you get your 401. K. She said I left the office in a state of shock. I had no idea it would be so complicated. Ms. Wilson gave me the name of a good real estate company to put the house on the market. She decided it was best to put the house on the market. Usually a woman was allowed to keep the house until the children came of age. Our daughter was already living on campus, so there was no need to delay the sale. And since I didn't need Melinda's permission to sell the house, the sooner I put it on the market, the sooner this whole thing would be over. I went back to my office and saw Melinda's car in the parking lot. As I pulled up, I saw her get out of the car, and I drove off. I still wasn't ready to talk to her. Waking up this morning, I felt like crap about what happened between me and Mel. I decided that maybe I should just talk to Mel about it. I needed to let him know that I didn't mean to hurt him. I just needed to move on with my life. I tried calling him, but he wouldn't pick up. I tried calling his office, and Joyce told me at first that he wasn't in yet. I realized what I had done was stupid. Mel never came to the office early. He always told me that every minute away from me was torture. So sitting in his office when he could be with me was pointless. I called back after nine in the morning and asked Joyce if he had arrived. She finally said he was there but wasn't taking calls from me. That was hard for me to understand. Is he really busy, Joyce? I asked. No busier than usual, she said. In fact, I do not think he's that busy. Then may I speak to him? I asked. In all the years Joyce had worked for Mel, I had never once heard her act or speak less politely. I'd seen her talk to difficult clients and keep her cool long after anyone else would have hung up the phone. God darn it, Melinda, she shouted. He won't talk to you. What did you expect? You ripped his heart out. And then you want to talk? If you want my opinion, he's lucky he got rid of you. Do not call here again. Then she hung up. I didn't even think about the fact that Mel might not be happy. He looked fine last night, but it was actually good for both of us. The fact that he didn't want to talk to me was hurting me. I was about to call Joyce back and remind her that she worked for Mel, not the other way around, and it was up to him to decide if I could call him or not. When suddenly, my phone beeped. There was another call waiting for me. I picked up the phone and heard my mom's voice. Melinda, what the heck is going on with you? She asked. What do you mean, Mom? I asked. Your father said you and Mel have something going on. She said, do I need to get over there and straighten things out? There's no need to figure anything out, Mom, I said. Melissa's all grown up now, and I just feel like I need to move on. I'm young enough to do something else with my life. I'm bored. I need to spread my wings and fly. Melinda, 
Do something else. I know exactly what you mean. Do not I? She asked. Melinda, do you remember my sister, your Aunt Kathy? She asked. I only had to let her know I'd hurt her. When Katie was about your age, she started having fun with just about anyone. Eventually, her husband found out he made Katie sleep on a cot in the basement for a year. Mom, what does this have to do with me? I asked. Tell Mel that your father and I will buy a cot for you, she said. Mom, it's not like that, I said. Mel and I will both be happier. That man loves you, she snapped back. You won't find anyone else who loves you that much. Your father said his voice sounded like he could barely stand on his feet. How could you do that to the man who cared for you most of your life? Mom, he'll get over it, I said. Then she started muttering to herself about stupid kids and hung up. I started to realize that everyone was trying to paint me as the bad guy just because I wanted to get out of a bad situation. What was I supposed to do? Sacrifice my happiness to the altar of St. Mel's butt? To heck with that idea. I moved on. It was Friday. I was going out with Greg that evening. I was excited because for the first time, I didn't have to hide. But I wanted to clear the air with Mel. So I decided to go to his place. The guards at the building wouldn't let me in. I could smell Joyce's hand in it just as I was getting into my car. Mel's Mustang pulled into the parking lot. I got out of the car and waved at him. He pulled out of the parking lot and drove off. I was so used to him being happy to see me any time he wanted to see me that I just sat there in shock. I went home to get ready for my date. I showered and used my favorite bath, scents, and perfume. I wanted to drive Greg crazy. I wore a dress that I really liked. It was a very rich blue color that looked really good against my long brown hair and blue eyes. I had had the dress for a long time, but it still looked good on me. Maybe not as good as when I was 30, but I never had any complaints. I spent a lot of time doing my hair and makeup. I wanted Greg to be really proud to have me in his arms. I had to let people know that he had a reason to be with me and not some 25-year-old hottie. I had just finished combing my hair when the door slammed. A lot of thoughts ran through my head. I thought that maybe Mel was back and angry. I got up from the table and went to see who it was. Mom, are you crazy? My daughter Melissa screamed. She ran up the stairs and looked at me like I was crazy. Where's my dad? From the look on her face, you'd think I'd killed him. I... I... I do not know, Lisa, I stammered. We ended up having a big argument about what I was doing. Why the heck did everyone think I was making a mistake? Do not you dare talk to me like that, young lady. I yelled at her. I needed to regain control of the situation. I'm your mother, and you need to treat me with respect. If you can't do that, then maybe you shouldn't come to my house or expect me to continue paying for your education. Mom, if you acted like you deserved respect, I'd give it to you. Right now. I think your hormones are out of balance and you're ruining your life. If I didn't love you and want the best for you, I'd just let you pee in the wind. On the other hand, this is my house too. And Daddy paid for it. Not you. Daddy also pays for my schooling. Not you. Just as I was about to respond to her words, the doorbell rang. She went to the door and opened it. She stared at Greg as if he'd just come from Mars. What can I do for you? She asked. I'm Greg, baby, he said. Greg? Baby? Who? She asked, looking at him strangely. What kind of name is Greg, baby? Mom, you're kidding, right? She asked. I have to take you to the doctor. Come in, Greg, I said, looking past her. And who is this lovely creature? Greg asked, keeping his eyes on Melissa from the moment she appeared. Greg Martin, meet my daughter, Melissa Conrad, I said. Greg held out his hand to Melissa. Do not bother, Fonzie, she snapped back. You won't be here long. Mom, can I talk to you upstairs? She grabbed my hand and dragged me up the stairs. You can't be serious, she said. What's he, 25? He's 29 years old, I said. And what does he do for a living, she asked. I didn't really know, so I shrugged. Melissa, we can talk about all this later, I said. When I get home from my date, we'll sit down and talk about all of this. Mom, I'm not going to be here, she said. I'm not going to stay in this house until either you come to your senses or Daddy decides to move back in. Then she left, slamming the door. Goodbye. I went downstairs, determined not to let her ruin my evening. Where are we going, Greg? 
I asked. Greg's car wouldn't start. He had to start the car twice on the way to my house, so I drove us. We ended up at the rundown club he wanted to go to. He danced with me once and with many other people, including dancing with two male friends a couple of times. He didn't introduce me to any of his friends. My dress was ruined when someone spilled beer on it. By the time we left, I had no money left. I drove us back home. Greg went inside, and we spent the rest of the evening pleasantly waking up early in the morning. I found Greg moving his things into my house. We're going to be very happy, baby, he purred. I was a little angry because he didn't ask my permission to move, but upon reflection, I realized that all couples go through these little arguments and disagreements. I told him about the barbecue at my parents' house, and he said he wasn't going. That's how our first fight started. I couldn't believe the day had gone so badly. Maybe it was because I was comparing him to Mel. It wasn't fair to either of them. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, Mel showed up. I heard the rumble of his car, and I knew it was him. I ran down the stairs to try to prevent a confrontation. I saw the two of them standing on the porch talking. Then Mel turned and walked away before I could speak to him. I ran down the driveway, calling out to him, but he didn't even slow down. What did he want? I asked. He's a good guy, Greg said, and his car is pretty darn cool. He just told me to treat you well and hope we'd be happy. He came by to pick up some more of his stuff. He said he came now because he thought we'd be at your parents' house by now. He said something about us having to move out soon. What? I asked. What are you talking about? Why are you yelling at me? He asked. He walked away. And when I walked into the house, he was lying with his feet up on my white linen couch, drinking a beer. I just looked at him. I'll go with you to your parents' house if you let me have a party, he said. He explained to me that he wanted to invite some of his friends over to introduce them to me and give them a chance to see how happy we would be. I was so happy that he suggested we go to a barbecue at my parents' house that I immediately agreed. I was also pleased that we seemed to be leaning toward compromise and making decisions as equals. It was a big step in our relationship. I won't go into details, but my parents and most of my family and friends hated Greg. My dad ended up kicking him out of the house. Actually, my dad just told him to get out. It was my brother-in-law who grabbed him by the collar and frog-marched him to the door. I told my father he was wrong to make Greg leave. He said I could go with him. I told him he was making a big deal out of it. All Greg did was fart loudly a few times and tell a few stupid jokes. He was just trying to be friendly in a strange situation with a group of people he didn't know. Maybe he was a little loud and not politically correct, but I was going to spend the rest of my life with him so they needed to adjust. When we got back to the house, I noticed that of Mel's things were gone. He had left me a card with his lawyer's name and number on it so I could give the information to my lawyer. I didn't have one yet. On Saturday night, Greg and I stayed home. He invited a few people over, and they sat around and played games on the video game system he had set up on my TV. I was alone most of the night until they left. Then Greg and I made love, and he fell asleep. Monday, I woke up and asked Greg if he needed to go to work or something. I wanted to take the time to clean the house. The mess hadn't been this bad since Melissa had been in her teens and thrown a party. That's when I found out that Greg was on hiatus, or, in other words, unemployed. The doorbell rang and Greg answered it. It's for you, baby, he called out. I stumbled down the stairs, still trying to figure out the parameters of my new relationship. I noticed Greg staring intently at the man standing at the door. As I approached the door, I saw a young woman sitting there. She was in her early twenties, and she was quite pretty. At her feet was one of those thin briefcases, and in her hands, she held a file folder. She was chewing gum and looked bored. It seemed like she was selling magazine subscriptions or something to make some extra money for school. She looked up at me as I approached her and asked me my name. I was sure she had gotten my name from one of those internet lists. The companies that make these lists buy and sell addresses and names to sell you products that, based on your history, you seem to be interested in. Melinda Conrad. She asked in a bored voice. Yes, I said, but I do not. You have been served, she said. She handed me a packet of papers, and before I could ask her anything else, I turned and walked away. She was still crunching her gum and looking in her briefcase for another folder. She looked at her watch 
got in her car, and drove away. I looked at the document she gave me. I guess I had expected Mel to just sit back and wait for me to decide for myself how we should divorce. Obviously, he didn't think so. The card he'd left the day before with his lawyer's information was still lying around upstairs. He was pushing for a divorce, and I was beginning to wonder if I even wanted one, in addition to the divorce papers. There was a paper notifying me that Mel was selling my house as part of the divorce settlement. I had 30 days to find a new living space or make other arrangements. It also detailed that if I wanted, I could buy our current home from Mel. Mel proposed divorce based on irreconcilable differences. There would be no child support, as Melissa had already turned 18. He intended to continue to support her, but the paperwork stated that her agreement would be separate from mine and I would have to work out the details with her. I knew there would be no problem. Mel loved his daughter. She might be better off than I was. He offered me a small amount of alimony for only six months and 40% of our savings in checking account balances. He has excluded me from his retirement plan. If I did not agree to this agreement, he would file a claim of infidelity, which I had already admitted to. There was too much information for me to know since the divorce was being demanded by me. He was also paying my attorney fees. This meant that my attorney fees would eat up any amount of money I received. In addition, under the circumstances, Mel was being generous to me in regards the house. He could have just thrown me out on the street when we first bought the house. My name wasn't on the mortgage because I didn't want it on there. We weren't sure we could afford the payments, and if we lost the house or had to declare bankruptcy. We figured having a good credit history for one of us wouldn't be a bad thing. Since the house was all in Mel's name, he could just kick me out, especially since I'd cheated on him and brought Greg to live in the house. As these thoughts ran through my head, I realized I was in trouble. For more than 20 years, Mel had handled all of our lives. He paid all the bills, took out the mortgage, bought the cars, and did everything else. I wasn't sure I knew how to find a new place to live, let alone how to pay for it. Mel was also a gentleman, and that he didn't empty our bank accounts. He only took out 50% of the accounts in savings. This meant that all money in the accounts did not belong to me. If I had spent more than 40% of the previous total balance, I would have had to pay the money back. The more serious problem was the house. Our house was worth about $200,000. That meant that if the house sold for that amount, I would get $80,000. But if I wanted to live in it, I would have to pay Mel $120,000. I wasn't sure I could get a mortgage or loan for that amount, especially since I had no job or credit. I also couldn't take out any kind of loan against the property because, again, the house wasn't in my name, so I had no equity on paper. I needed to find the cheapest lawyer I could find, and as soon as possible, I needed to talk to Mel to see if there was any way out of this. Maybe I could just give him the house in exchange for him letting me live in it, until I got back on my feet. That would give me a few months to figure out what I want to do about the divorce. Mel and I really needed to talk. The problem was that he just didn't want to talk to me. I decided I needed someone to stand up for me. I called my dad and asked if he would call Mel for me. He said no. Melinda, you are my daughter. I am very shocked and disappointed by this whole situation. This man has turned out to be a much better son-in-law than I expected. I need to call him soon. I need to apologize to him for our last phone conversation. He called me a couple of days ago, trying to arrange to spend time with your mom and me on our anniversary. I finally pestered him about why he couldn't make it to the barbecue. He didn't come because he didn't want any drama or distractions going on at our anniversary. I couldn't believe what he said you did to him. My mother's voice could be heard in the background. And then you showed up with that bully and ruined our party. Truth be told, I wish Mel had come to the barbecue instead of you. So if you're trying to convince me to get him to meet you, forget it. He's suffering enough as it is. Give him some peace. You wanted a divorce. He's giving it to you. Although, if it was me, if I was married to you, and you tried to do something like that, I'd kick your butt. After that, my father hung up the phone. I decided to call my daughter and see if she would help me. After all, she wanted us to be together again. Melissa was even less helpful than her grandparents, she didn't want to talk to me at all. I called her cell phone several times, but the receiver was immediately transferred to voicemail. 
The third time I called, she changed her greeting to one tailor made for me. Hi, this is Melissa. I can't take your call right now. Leave a message at the tone. Unless you're my ex-mother, in which case you shouldn't call or leave messages because I do not want to hear from you. Bye. Selfishness comes with a price. And though I didn't realize it, I was just beginning to pay it. The divorce handled by Ann Wilson. She was a wonderful woman, despite her initial attitude toward me. During our first meeting, I noticed that she was very caring and concerned about my well-being. She called me every day to let me know what was going on and what I could expect as a result. She let me know right after Melinda received the summons. She also asked me what I wanted to do in each particular situation. Some of the things she wanted me to do seemed wrong to me. She suggested that I take an extended leave of absence from work. That way, I would have no income, and I might be able to get by without paying Melinda alimony. I liked my job, but the thought of being tied to Melinda for any length of time was beyond me. There were a few ideas that I often wished I had time for. There were also several places I wanted to see her visit. Perhaps the idea of taking a vacation at work wasn't as bad as I first thought. Dad, this place is perfect. It's big as a darn house. It has three bedrooms, and I love the pool, and the gym will keep you from going to the gym. I think you should take it. My daughter Melissa said I brought Lisa to the apartment I was going to rent. I had already decided I liked the place. The monthly fee was high, but they had six-month and one-year lease options. At this point, renting for six months while I looked for a house seemed like the perfect option. Melissa has been behaving wonderfully the last few days. She lived with her grandparents to be close to me, and she drove to and from her school every day. Without her support, I wasn't sure I would have made it through. Joyce was great, too. She had taken it upon herself to take care of me, and even though it was too soon had already started trying to set me up with someone else. If you pick up one apple with a worm, it doesn't mean you have to give up apples, she said. It only takes me 15 or 20 minutes to find someone you'll be happy with. Over the past week, I had become less hurt. I wasn't so angry with Melinda anymore, and I understood her position to some extent. If she really wasn't happy with me, she deserved to be with someone who could make her happy. The only thing that annoyed me was the way she did it, and how cavalierly she chose to tell me so. For the years we spent together, I deserved better. I probably would have respected her more if she had come to me and told me she wasn't happy. Maybe she would have given me a chance to change our lives to make her happy. There's nothing I wouldn't do for her. But she chose to find a boyfriend, and then tell me she wanted a divorce. And now she seems to want to talk about everything and try to be friends. Screw her. I can make my own friends. I called the manager of the complex and told him I would take the apartment. It was ready to move in, so I would write him a check in the morning, and I would want to move in over the weekend. As I kissed Lissa goodbye before she left for her grandparents' house, I realized that I was going to be okay. I remembered how my parents made me take piano lessons when I was eight years old. My piano teacher, Mrs. Lipscomb, taught me how to rhyme so I could remember the lines on the sheet music, e.g., BDF. Every good boy does fine. I tried to be a good boy my whole darn life. I could do it. At first, when Mel brought it down on me, I saw no way out. Only misery and loneliness. But I started to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was in trouble, and I knew it. Greg had drained his savings account to buy himself a car. Over the past two weeks, I'd started to wonder why I even wanted to be with him. Not only did he move into the house without asking, he started using the house as a hangout for all of his friends. They would stop by his house at all hours of the day and night, and many of his friends were women. Then he started bugging me that we didn't really have an equal relationship. We didn't separate and divide each other. He didn't understand why I could do it with Mel, and he couldn't. So I gave him a key and foolishly gave him access to my bank account and within a week, he had completely drained the savings account for a used Honda. I tried to explain to him that the divorce seemed to be in full swing. It looked like Mel was going to get his 60%. I agreed, so as not to be called an adulteress, and not to drag Greg into it. Mel was also unwilling to give me any leeway with the house. We only had two weeks to go, and at the rate things were going, we wouldn't have enough money to buy another house. I might have to move into an apartment. 
Even worse was learning that Mel was going to take a break from work for a few months, maybe even a couple of years, until he got over the depression that our breakup had put him in. That meant he would have no income, which meant I probably wouldn't get any child support. He was even letting his daughter down. As I learned from my sister, Melissa was now living with my parents to support my father emotionally. This weekend she was supposedly going to move out of the house, so he probably wasn't giving her enough money to stay on campus. Last night was the worst. After trying to put the house in order because of the mess, Greg and his friends seemed to be leaving everywhere. I went out on the deck to relax a bit. I think I dozed off. I woke up to someone tapping me on the shoulder. It was Greg, of course. He wanted to have fun. Greg? I shouted, pushing him away from me. If you really loved me and wanted us to be together forever, you wouldn't have a problem with that, he said. I suppose next you'll want me to move out. I didn't know if I was doing it because I really thought he was hurting, or because if I let this relationship dissolve, it would mean I had thrown my marriage away for nothing. No, Greg, I said. Why indeed? Do not be like that, he said. I'm not in the mood. I called out. Good night. I bet you'd be in the mood if I were Mel, wouldn't you? He snapped. Then he left the room, slamming the door behind him. I do not know for sure if I was relieved or saddened that he was gone, but I thought about his question, and I knew what the answer would be. By then, I was beginning to realize that I had been stupid. The only problem was that I had no exit strategy. Greg told me that he would start work in a few weeks and that things would work out after that. He needed a car to commute to and from work and had a favorable deal with her. I got up about an hour after he left. I was ashamed that we'd had a fight, and I wanted to talk about it. Our relationship was spiraling out of control. In some ways, it was similar to what happened with Mel in my marriage to Mel. I should have talked to him about my feelings if I had. Maybe we would still be together. I swore I wouldn't make that mistake with Greg. Greg couldn't change if I didn't talk to him about things I didn't like. We were from different generations and had lifestyles. There were bound to be conflicts between us. I walked down to the living room and heard a sound. One of Greg's darn friends is entertaining some woman in my house. I thought when I walked into the room, I saw that I was right. Only it wasn't one of Greg's friends. It was Greg himself. I know you're upset, he said, but it's really your fault. You're the one who said no. I didn't say a word. I just turned around and walked out onto the deck. I sat down in one of the lounge chairs I'd seen online, and Mel had painstakingly made and painted to make me happy as I sat in the chair. I noticed that the other three chairs from the set had been thrown into the pool, and the chlorine was already starting to wash the paint out of them. I just started crying and praying to wake up, and it all turned out to be just a scary dream. I fell asleep sitting by the pool again. When I woke up the next morning, I looked at the clock. I was freezing. I had slept outside and Greg hadn't come in and woke me up. Plus, I was late for a meeting with my lawyers to sign the final divorce agreement. I approached the house, but the door was closed. Not only closed, but locked. I started knocking on the door, and after about ten minutes, the girl Greg had entertained last night let me in. She didn't say anything. She just opened the door and left. She was walking back up the stairs when I called out to her. Where are you going? I asked her back to bed. She yawned sleepily. You're not sleeping in my room, I said. Greg said. I could. She muttered. Get out of my house or I'll call the police. I shouted. Screw you, Grandma. She snapped back. I've been kicked out of far better homes than this one. I'll be glad when Greg leaves you. You just suck the fun out of everything. I took a quick shower and changed into more or less decent clothes. I noticed that someone had gone through my purse and all my cash gone. I jumped in my car and drove to Mel's attorney's office. The man who represented my interests was there as well. I sat through about half an hour of legal chatter and signed the papers where I was told to. The divorce will be final in 90 days. Mel's attorney said, Wait, I asked. Where is my husband? You do not have a husband anymore, said Mel's lawyer. A big, angry woman. But I still have 90 days to change my mind, right? I asked. I knew I didn't need 90 days. I didn't need 90 minutes. I wanted Mel to come home and help me kick those bastards out of our house. I thought I could talk to Mel. I said maybe it's not too late to change things. It could be my fault. 
My lawyer said in 90% of cases like this, although it's not necessary, both parties are usually present in case something goes wrong. That doesn't mean he should have been here. It was just expected. He's not coming. Mel's lawyer said he signed the papers three days ago. He wants nothing more to do with you. He's not even in town right now. He's gone on a cruise with his daughter. They call it a freedom cruise. I think you know why. I sat and watched woman. She seemed to take great pleasure in the fact that I was unhappy. What if I changed my mind? I whined. I whined. They both looked at me and shook their heads. I could see that none of this meant anything to them. It was just another job. They started putting papers into folders and briefcases and barely paid attention to me. I want to talk to Mel. I shouted. I want. I want my husband back. I got the impression that none of them cared what I wanted. I was sure the woman was trying hard not to laugh. I grabbed her by the shoulders. She looked at my lawyer as if asking him if he'd seen me grab her. I had a feeling that if I didn't let go of her, I was going to get hurt. So I quickly backed off and tried a different tactic. You are a woman, I said. Have you no sympathy for me? I have made a great mistake. Can't you help me? Why would I want to do that? She asked coldly. Besides, I can't give you the help you need. She put the briefcase back on the table and turned to me. I rarely handled divorce cases involving men, she began. I enjoy defending women who have been treated unfairly by their spouses. In your husband's case, I made an exception, because when I first saw him, he was in so much pain that he reminded me of some of the worst women I imagined. He was just in shock at what you had done to him. If I hadn't helped him pull his head out of his butt, he probably would have just given you all his money and his house just to get rid of you. But I began. Her face took on a harder expression, but nothing. She snapped back. Do you know how many women are abused by their husbands? They're cheated on their beaten. They're robbed. They're ignored. Most of those women would die to have a man like the one you just crap on in their lives. You put that poor man through heck. Now he's finally free of you and starting to move on with his life. But things aren't going well for your boyfriend. So you decide you want your husband back. Complicated crap, jerk. Life goes on. She turned and picked up her briefcase, then gestured for me to leave her office because she was leaving too. Three weeks after signing the divorce papers, Melissa and I returned from our cruise, and I started messing around in my workshop. I remember it in great detail. It was one of those moments we never forget. I do not know why I didn't think of it sooner. I had the idea to connect the servo controller directly to its own processor and sensor. I made three such controllers just to test them out. The next day, I took one of them to one of my company's manufacturing plants, together with one of our equipment repair technicians. I hooked it up to a machine that wasn't working. It was great. My module allowed the machine to sense approaching objects around it and move to avoid them without having to put it into a program. I felt like I was onto something. I had another friend who was into robotics. I gave him one of my modules. I went home, finalized the remaining module, and a few days later, I applied for my first patent. I worked with one of those companies that specialize in bringing inventions to market, and things moved very quickly. Literally hundreds of companies wanted to license my patent, and even more who were interested in buying ready-made modules. I had to hire a lawyer and an accountant. We set up two small companies. One was licensing my patent and everything else I had invented. The other was manufacturing the modules. We outsourced the manufacturing to a small local store that was struggling to keep its doors open. My plan was to eventually buy out the store and keep the owner as manager. In less than three months, I had more money than I knew what to do with. Melissa and I moved into a house that was even bigger than the one we had lived in with her mother. I hired Joyce from my old company because I couldn't think of who I would prefer as my assistant. Melissa worked for me too, while she was still in school. She was starting to think about changing her major from humanities to business. My in-laws, with whom we were still very friendly, rejoiced at our success. They called and invited us to Thanksgiving dinner. Bob told me I needn't worry about Melinda's presence. She hadn't been welcome in their home since the anniversary fiasco when she brought that man as they called Greg. I agreed for both Melissa and myself. After hanging up the phone, I walked out to the pool where my daughter and a few of her friends were sunbathing. Mel, just out of curiosity, have you heard anything about your mother lately? 
I asked. She got up and walked me into the house, leaving her friends to sunbathe. Daddy, she's calling so often that I had to change our number. Melissa said, I do not know what's wrong with her. You gave her all that money. Heck, the money from the sale of the house alone should have been enough for two or three years of trouble. Free living while she looked for a job or went back to school. I do not know what happened to her. Common sense. Now she lives with Greg in a crappy little apartment downtown. Almost all of her money is gone. I've heard horrible things about him and his friends from people I know at school who also know them. I looked her seriously. Dad, if you hear about this, it will only hurt you. Let's just live our lives. Besides, do not you have a date tonight? I smiled, thinking about it. I was going on my third date with a woman I'd met on our cruise, even though we had gotten along great on the ship. It had taken me a long time to connect with her after we got home. It was mostly my fault. I just couldn't think of a reason to call her. Finally, as soon as I had the patent finalized, she called me. It turned out that my nosy daughter was tired of me messing around in the apartment all day. So she called her. Melanie Fitzgerald was a widow. Her husband had died in the service five years before we met on the cruise. What brought us together was that we had both lost someone we loved deeply. It was very important to both of us. And we gradually came out of our shells. By the time Melissa brought us back together, we both missed each other, but didn't know how to reach out. Our first date was a traditional dinner and a movie date. On our second date, we danced at a club, and tonight we were going to go on a river cruise, have dinner and dance some more. I hoped it would go as well as it did on the first two dates. I especially enjoyed dancing with her. The feelings I had when she pressed her whole body against me let me know that everything was going to be okay. I got kicked in the teeth by what Melinda did, but I got up and went on with my life. I got into my Mustang and headed toward Melanie's house. As soon as I started the engine, the stereo came on, and it almost made my head spin. Melissa drove my car to the store in the morning, and she had one of her CDs playing. She was listening to Ozzy Osbourne's, I Do Not Want to Stop. I turned the volume down a bit and then smiled and let it blast. It was a great driving song. Anyway, as I pulled away from the curb, I noticed another car coming from the opposite direction but I didn't pay any attention to it. I drove toward Melanie's house listening to Ozzy yell about how he wasn't going to stop. All my life, I've been on a high. I do not know what I'm doing. I just know I do not want to stop. Yep, you and me, Ozzy. I thought I hadn't noticed until that moment. But a car, a brightly colored Honda, was following me. The car looked like something out of a circus. It was one of those cars that only a teenager who has watched Fast and Furious too many times can drive. The guy was probably following me, hoping I'd overtake him when I pulled up to Melanie's house. I got out of the car. I turned off the stereo because she lived in a nice neighborhood. Melanie was wearing a very pretty gray velour dress that fit her curves perfectly. She stepped off the porch and literally ran up to me as soon as I got out of the car. She hugged me tightly and even kissed me. It was the first time we actually kissed. I'm so excited about it, she said. Come on, I said. We've been on bigger and probably much nicer boats together. It's not the boat, honey, she said. It's being with you. I've missed you. I haven't seen you in two days. And after what happened on our last date, I'm still reeling. I think we're going to have to rethink our policy of not seeing each other much during the week. Talking to you on the phone is great, but it's not enough. We both turned around when we heard the car door slammed behind us. Melinda climbed out of the clown's Honda and walked briskly toward us. Get your hands off him, she shouted. I quickly stepped between Melanie and Melinda. Melanie Fitzgerald, this is my ex-wife, Melinda Harris, I said. This is Melinda Conrad, Melinda snapped back. Can I talk to you, Mill? she asked. We have nothing to talk about, I said. I've met all the terms of our divorce agreement. You didn't get your alimony check last week because alimony ran out two months ago. I was kind enough to give you another check last month, but I'm done. Do not have any connection anymore. So if you'll excuse us, Mal will always be connected. We have a daughter in common, she said. Melissa is a grown woman, I said. Your relationship with her is none of my concern. I cannot and will not try to influence her one way or the other. But Mel, what if I make a mistake, she asked. Then you pick up the pieces and get on with your life like I had to. 
I said I made a mistake. I chose the wrong woman to fall in love with, and it came back to hurt me 20 years later. For a while, I didn't think I'd make it. But now my life is beautiful again. You can get your life back together, too. Mel, we need to talk. There are a lot of things I need to tell you, she said, and I do not like the idea of you going out with anyone until we figure this out. I didn't like you having fun with someone while we were still married. But it didn't seem to bother you. So what I do now that we're divorced is none of your business, Melinda. We have nothing to talk about. I opened the door and helped Melanie into her seat. Then I got into the car and drove away, leaving Melinda standing still. Two weeks later, I sat at my desk and pondered a major issue. I wasn't sure if I was rushing things too fast in my relationship with Melanie. What we had was great, but I wanted more. The door opened, and there she was. When I saw her enter the office and head toward me with a wide, beautiful smile, I quickly tried to shove the papers I was looking through under my desk. That was one of my problems. Melanie made me feel special every time I saw her. Like when she saw me, she was just going about her day. That wasn't the case with Melinda. Everything I did for Melinda, she took it as if it was something deserved. She never appreciated anything. That's probably what led to our breakup more than anything else. Let me see what you're so interested in, whatever it is. I'll try it for you. Melanie had a way of making me just melt. So when she reached down and pulled out the papers, I was trying to hide. I just let her take them. She looked at them, and what I was looking at registered. I thought her smile was bright before, but now it was even brighter. Mel, are you looking at them for me? For us? She asked. I nodded. Do you really want me? She asked. I nodded again. She cried and threw herself on top of me. My office chair gave out and overturned, knocking us both to the floor. Joyce came running into the office and found us on the floor, hugging each other. I hate to interrupt you, but you have to see this. Joyce smirked. She led us both through the outer office to a conference room. In the hallway, we saw about 20 people applying for jobs with us. Some were office workers or secretaries. Others were applying for jobs in the shop to manufacture my sensor modules. Look, Joyce said she pointed to Greg. Human Resources flagged him because he claimed to be a friend of yours. Well, in a way is. I laughed. If it weren't for him, I'd still be married to Melinda. Should they hire him? She asked. Heck no, I said. Come on, Mel. Let's go buy a ring. Everything came to a head sometime after I introduced my husband to that woman. I was barely on my feet when I saw them together. He was still the shy, caring man I'd fallen in love with, the one I'd taken for granted. But it was like he was glowing. He was truly happy. I only realized it by the loud music he was playing in his darn Mustang. And her body language was intimidating. She couldn't wait for him to come to her door. How stupid could she be? Doesn't she know that? You can't let a guy know you want to see him too badly. You'll lose your edge. No sooner had his car moved than she ran out of the house and pounced on him. I realized what she was going to do at the first opportunity. I walked over to them, determined to separate them. I had to get them away from this woman before it was too late. That morning, I made the decision to get him back. I also had to get rid of Greg. What did I see in him? I guess I was a stupid, bored woman who thought she deserved better and thought her life was a dead end. I threw away the best part of my life after I caught Greg cheating. The first time I let him convince me that it was my fault for denying him love. It just opened the floodgates. Greg was now bringing women home at least a couple of times a week. He told me we were in an open relationship. He reminded me that when we first met, I was still having love with Mel. He didn't seem to think the fact that I was married to Mel mattered. Entertaining Greg had become a chore. Do you want to mess around with her? He asked before the man could answer. I got up and got dressed. I left my apartment and drove to my parents' house. It took a while, but I convinced them to let me in. I told them the whole story, and they let me stay there for the night while I was there. I noticed that there were new paintings on the mantle in the group. They were taken on Thanksgiving Day. My mom told me as I looked at them. One of the pictures struck me in the heart. It captured everyone who was at my parents' house for Thanksgiving dinner. In the center of the group of friends and family was a subgroup. In between, 
my parents were Mel and that woman. Between them was my daughter. They both had their arms around Melissa, and all three were cheek to cheek. Mel, Mel, and once again, Mel together. They were all smiling and clearly having a good time. It was exactly like the picture we took of the three of us when our family was together. It seemed like my husband and daughter just took over for me without a second thought. Even my own parents preferred their company to mine. Tears rolled down my cheeks as I stared at the picture. Everything in me was talking about throwing the darn picture against the wall or into the fire. It took more strength than I ever thought possible to just put the picture back on the mantle. I tried very hard to get it in the same place, if not the same place. What did you expect? Dad asked behind my back. I guess you thought they'd wait for you forever. Dad, you didn't even invite me to Thanksgiving, but you invited her. I cried. Honey, your boyfriend ruined our anniversary party. You made it clear that he was the one you wanted to be with. Despite what told you, you even gave up your own baby to be with this one. This. I can't call him a man because no matter how old he is, he acts like a spoiled brat. And that's exactly what you've been acting like. Dad sat down on the couch. My granddaughter told you she wouldn't come back to your house until you got rid of him. It was your own child. You let her leave this house. It sent a clear message to everyone that you thought being with him was more important than her or us, for that matter. Melvin tried to avoid seeing you. He let you get what you wanted. You can't blame him for trying to find someone he could be happy with. As for Thanksgiving, we told you on the anniversary that you couldn't bring that jerk you were with into our house. And you're still with him. We invited Mel to come to Thanksgiving, because whether he's married to you or not, he's part of our family. He may not be your husband anymore, but he's still our son-in-law, because he's the father of my granddaughter and the woman he brought with him. He asked our permission first. Unlike how you just showed up with your second butthole, Melanie is a wonderful woman. I like her very much. And if Melvin couldn't get in touch with you, she is exactly who I would want for him and for my granddaughter. She is polite, courteous, and helpful. She is welcome in this home whenever she comes. She's not you, Melinda. She's not my daughter. But Melvin has a right to be happy, too. So we should be happy if he found her. But, Daddy, I want him back. I... He only shook his head. Melinda, from the way the three of them have been getting along and what they've been talking about, it may be too late for that. Even if Melvin doesn't marry her, he still might not want to go back to you. You've hurt him badly. Why would he put himself in that position again? Listening to their conversation, I realized that Melissa was the one who pushed them together. Maybe she wasn't just looking for someone for Melvin. Maybe she was looking for someone to take place in her life. Life's too short to be miserable all the time. You had a great life. You had a beautiful family. You didn't appreciate what you had. And then someone else came along and picked it up where you threw it away. After listening to him, I realized he was right. The next day, I went back to my little apartment and started cleaning. When Greg woke up, I told him it was time for him and all his friends to leave. As I cleaned, I found several delinquent notices and an eviction notice. I didn't know any of them had come in. I gave Greg access to my bank account so he could pay his bills. He didn't pay any of them, and all the money disappeared. He tried to get a job last week, but was turned down. He told me that the company he wanted to work for was owned by Melvin. Within a year, my husband had become more successful than I could have imagined, but unfortunately, he wanted nothing to do with me. Yesterday, I went to fill out an application for a job with them myself. I sat in a big room and filled out the application form with a lot of other people. When they started calling names, I felt like I had a good chance. Many of the people I sat with who had no skills came back with smiles and said they had gotten jobs. As I waited to be called, I got that feeling you get when someone is looking at you. I turned to my left and looked through the large glass window. My daughter was in the hallway outside room. She was pointing at me, talking to another woman. The woman nodded her head a few times and walked into the room I was sitting in. She turned to the people, conducting the interviews, and they shuffled their papers. The man at the desk immediately called me. My number wasn't even there, and they called me by name. I entered the interview room and sat down in front of the desk. There were three people sitting behind it. 
Two of them were women. I felt even better about my chances. I was sure my daughter had advanced me in line, and who knew what might happen if we all worked together. Maybe I would get my family back. After all, you do not have any work history, said one of the women behind the counter. She did not ask me a question, but simply stated what she saw on my resume. Well, in a way, yes, I said. I've been married for over twenty years to the man you all work for. Mr. Conrad doesn't believe in nepotism. The man said. Both women shook their heads. You do not have any skills either, the other woman said. It says here that you have a college degree. What institution did you get your degree, and what was your specialty? Melvin and I met in college. I said I got my degree at the same colleges. Him, but not the same college. I remember that Melvin probably remembers it too. Thank you so much for coming this morning, the first woman said again. She stood up and held out her hand for me to shake. Did I get the job? I asked. When am I going to start? What will I be doing? Will I be working with my husband and daughter? We have many more interviews to conduct before we make a final decision on any position, the man said. Either way, you'll be contacted. He stood up and extended his hand as well. I got the feeling that everything they were saying was utter nonsense. What they really meant to say was, do not call us. We'll call you ourselves. As I left the room, I realized that I was the first person they hadn't hired. I turned around and saw Melissa talking to the people who had just interviewed me. She nodded head and, without even looking at me, walked down the hallway in the other direction. My own daughter had just ruined my chance of getting a job. I had only one way out. I needed a place to live and money for food. I would be too ashamed to go back and live with my parents. I had to apply for government assistance. After all the years Melanie had paid taxes, they still owed me. Melinda Conrad. I snapped out of my thoughts when I heard my name. I walked into the office while the woman was reviewing the forms I'd filled out. How much do I get? I asked. Mrs. Conrad, what income did you receive last year? Did you receive any amounts in cash or settlements in the last twelve months? Your finances are not well described. What property do you have in your possession? Are you responsible for any children? It says here that you are recently divorced. Have you received any alimony or cash payments in connection with this? Well, I had alimony for six months, and I got $80,000 for selling the house, plus 40% of our checking and savings accounts. I said the woman looked up at me. Are you kidding? She asked. No. I said, you've squandered over $80,000 in less than a year, and you expect, get out of my office. My daughter Melinda walked into the office just as I was about to go in to see Melanie for her last day of work. Melanie wanted to work through the end of the month as not to leave her boss out of work, but we both decided that there was no reason for her to work if she just wanted something to do to keep her mind on work. There were plenty of things to do here that she could do. Besides, Melanie is only 36, and I'm 41. Maybe we can work on getting Melissa a brother or sister. Hi, honey, I said, picking up my jacket. Are you coming to Melanie's going away party? Yes, Daddy, I wouldn't miss it, she said. I just wanted to show you this. She handed me the application, which was stamped, rejected, not true. I laughed. Yeah, she laughed back. I just kissed her on the cheek and shook my head, and headed to my new wife's party. I was enjoying my life again. Everything was the way it was supposed to be. I no longer had any anger or resentment towards my ex, but my daughter probably still does. Rejection can be hard to deal with. Truth be told, I would love to hire Melinda and keep her close to where we work so she could see us regularly and see what she threw away. They say the best revenge is a life well lived. I'd like Melinda to how we live our lives, it would have amounted to poking her in the face every time she looked at us. I wasn't going to retaliate or do anything to Melinda. I just let karma deal with her. I focused on being a good boy and making myself happy. As I walked out the door, I was confused for a second trying to find my car. There were two nearly identical Mustangs parked next to the building in the parking lot reserved for management. It took me a second to realize which one was mine. It was even worse at home since Melanie now drove the exact same car too. Immediately I realized which one was mine. In fact, it was easy to tell. It was my car with the license plate EGBDF.